Great. Well, thanks, Jonathan. I am super excited today to uh, to be kicking off with you guys a little bit about um, a little bit about the, the developer movement, and we're going to talk today about introduction, introducing the Microsoft uh, design principles. I'm just going to try and switch a little bit here to uh, the camera to make sure you guys can hear me a little bit. Uh, great. So, uh, hi. I'd uh, like to add a little bit of video to you guys. Um, I'm uh, my name is Miguel Carrasco. I'm actually a Microsoft MVP as well as a Microsoft uh, Virtual Technology Specialist. Um, so what does that even mean other than a bunch of fancy letters at the end of my name? Uh, MVP, I'm an MVP in Blend. Uh, so what I've been doing over the last 10 years really is uh, user experience design. So I've been helping design interfaces uh, for a lot of top end uh, agencies and brands uh, across the world. Uh, recently working with Imaginet, which is where I work here in Winnipeg, I've been working with a lot of top clients like United Airlines and so forth. So uh, doing a lot of really cool things with user experience and when Windows 8 came along, we were just amazed at some of the incredible UI elements that we could, uh, we could bring to the table. Um, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into what all what, what all is with with Windows 8 and, and so forth. But one thing, if you guys can do for me, is uh, if you guys can, please feel free to um, uh, in the chat window if you have any questions or things like that. Obviously, I can't see you raise the hands. I usually present live. Uh, please type them into the chat window. We'll try and do some live Q and A at the end if we have some time. I'm going to try and go as quickly as possible and try and breathe as little as possible because there's a lot of content to cover. Um, so I'm going to get started right away. At the same time, if you want to add me on Facebook, I'd love it. Uh, just go to fb.me slash Miguel Carrasco. If you have any additional questions, you can ask me there as well. So I'm going to flip back uh, into the slides here uh, real quick so you guys can, uh, we can get started. So the reason I'm excited today uh, to be talking to you is for a number of reasons. Um, I can get my slides to move. There we go. <clears throat> One is uh, everything has been reimagined uh, with with Windows uh, Windows 8, and I'm super excited about this. And what does this really mean? Well, what Microsoft did is they really they took everything that was in Windows 8 and made it even better, more capable, more powerful, uh, more exciting. And they really what they really did is they took that new kind of fast and fluid start screen. They brought in a new touch, mouse, and keyboard interface, and they still kept everything that was great with Windows 8 and made it even better. Um, I know a lot of people have kind of said, well, you know, what, what are the big differences other than the, the start menu and things like that? Um, the reality is one of the things that I find incredibly powerful is the fact that the back end, Windows 7 itself, um, has been taken forward, uh, improved. Things like boot time, power saving mode, and even just the overall responsiveness of the operating system, even once you kind of move out of the new uh, uh, Windows 8 uh, modern user elements, uh, are incredibly powerful with Windows 8. So I love that. But at the same time, obviously, they've added this touch, mouse, and keyboard support, which really kind of gives all that to you for free. So not only can you use, like right now, I'm on a, if you go to my Facebook page, you'll see my, I took a picture of my, of everything I have in front of me right now. I have a touch screen, uh, LCD panel, a 28, 20 inch screen. I have a desktop uh, a computer underneath. I have a laptop computer on top of my, my uh, on, on top of my desk. I have a mouse. And Windows 8 works great with all of those things. Uh, at the same time, at home, I have an Xbox. I have all these devices. And really, that same modern user experience kind of flows throughout. And because we're here talking about apps, that's incredibly important because the huge, huge advantage you have with the Microsoft ecosystem is that everything kind of flows and moves the same. Microsoft is making a big bet that users don't want to have uh, a device that they use on their on their handheld, a device they use for their phone, a different interface for the television, a different interface for all these different devices. People want one interface. And they want to have touch, mouse, and keyboard kind of baked into all of that. So that's really what I want to talk to you about today. Before we get started, I'm going to give you a little bit of a quick run through of kind of where we came from. Because I think it's kind of fun, to be honest. And I think partly you come to presentations because you want to learn something and partly because you want to be a little bit entertained. So I thought I'd bring up an old screen. This is the old Microsoft Windows uh, DOS interface. And this is really kind of where we started. And I remember playing games back then. I used to play this game called uh, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and it was all DOS-based. And I remember even that game, it had some graphics and C art and things like that. And um, I remember having to reboot sometimes my computer to get uh, some additional memory, I'd actually have to put in a floppy disk to re 
reboot it and try and get some memory on my floppy disk to offload certain things. And this is the Sherlock Holmes interface screen. You had a list of commands. You could type in different commands like, you know, show me the map or show me where the ferry is or different things like that. Review the case information. And a lot of these things uh, kind of moved forward, obviously, into the future. But they still had things like, you know, fancy, you know, maps. And I call this fancy. Uh, but it was all done through, like, basic graphics and things like that. So Microsoft, again, kind of taking it a step a little bit step further, they came out with Microsoft Windows, which again, kind of really, and I think this is a real huge leap forward, the ability to have multiple uh, applications running on the screen at the same time. And I think this is kind of the big differentiator between Microsoft and a lot of other platforms you see today is that the ability to run multiple programs at the same time. And this is really what kind of is bread and butter to Microsoft, that the ability to do that across devices now uh, with Windows 8, uh, a huge differentiator. If you ever use the, a Surface device, uh, they're phenomenal because you're able to run multiple uh, applications at the same time. At the same time, you sit down on your couch and kind of snap things to different windows and things like that. It's just phenomenal. Um, but this idea was laid back in the foundation in Windows 1. And then Windows 95 came out, obviously, huge hurrah, Jay Leno came out on stage, it was an incredibly huge celebration, um, and again, now graphics started getting better, you started seeing more visual gaming, uh, Windows 98 came out, you know, really kind of brought on the Microsoft network, as well as Internet Explorer, things like that, so the internet really kind of came to light in 98, and again, with Windows 98, that's really where you saw the internet take off, because all of these devices that people were running different things on before started running Windows 98 which gave everybody the ability to dial up very easily into the internet and connect all these computers together and this is really what brought forward you know the dot-com revolution that occurred uh, later on of course uh, continuing to move forward Windows XP just another improvement again another improvement on top of the foundation that was laid with Windows 98 and people still run uh, Windows XP you know it's a great operating system uh, and again just taking things to that next level uh, with that you know uh, another operating system uh, came out I'm not gonna say the name of it <coughs> Vista uh, and again it kind of brought some really cool things to the table as well and with that then came Windows 7 and Windows 7 really was kind of an entirely fresh kind of new look, you know, memory management issues resolved, a whole bunch of really cool things, and all these driver issues were just a thing of the past. You know, nowadays, I remember 10 years ago, you'd buy a, you'd buy a printer and you'd be spending two hours trying to get a printer installed or, you know, another hour trying to get a webcam installed. I mean, all those things now, even Windows 7, Windows 8, it's just amazing. You can plug any device into it. It'll detect it. It'll search the internet. It'll install it. Probably already has the drivers uh, for it. The install itself is smaller just just amazing where things have come giving companies the ability to completely customize and brand their their user interfaces and kind of take them to the next level uh, I'd imagine that you know we do custom desktop development for companies so here's an example of using SharePoint on the desktop so we have a custom branded calendar custom branded events all these controls and again we've developed some incredible user experiences for them there at the same time, Microsoft has innovated on the television. Before anyone started talking about, um, you know, competitor TV, um, Microsoft was doing this way back in the day, ten years ago, right? Media Center, and they continue and continue to evolve these technologies and really trying to bring everything together with the Xbox and the new Xbox that's coming out. I've been privileged to hear a lot about it and see uh, certain snippets about it, and just amazing what you're about to hear in the next coming months. Um, at the same time, the phone, you know, the phone, yes, the phone, you know, has been out there now for, for a couple of years, the new smartphone and the touch screens, but you need to remember back in the day, again, Windows CE devices, Microsoft has always been innovating and trying to come up with new, not just the same, but new. Uh, you know, they're never one to kind of duplicate and, and copy. What they really always try and attempt, uh, attempt to do is take things to that next level, and they've definitely done that. You know, you can read on any, any magazine, you know, the new Windows 8 and the new kind of metro and modern user uh, interface elements, sorry, um, are all kind of fresh, you know, these live tiles that you can see on a phone. Uh, I can just look at my, you know, Windows 8 phone and I can look at it and see how many phone calls have I missed. 
any text messages, uh, any emails that have come up, you know, works flawlessly with Office 365 and Exchange. Uh, it's just so easy and simple. I don't need to go into multiple applications. The whole idea of applications, in fact, we're going to learn is kind of completely shifted into a more graphical interface. And these things are very important when you define applications because you need to understand that you need to give context to people as they browse through your applications. You know, these really, really clean screens that you can kind of see your music, history, news, and apps, and things like that. And even, you know, the new interfaces on the newer phones where you have the ability to customize the phone to however you want. So, you know, if you're a busy mom, you can put custom uh, applications and pin them and size them in different ways. If you're a sports fan, you can set up your favorite sports team and pin that to your to your screen. Or if you're a music buff or, 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 or things like that, you can automatically just set up the phone however you want. So every phone kind of becomes your own phone. And even looking at uh, at the Xbox, right? This is the Xbox screen from a few a few years ago now. And you know, taking it to the next level again, now again, more like the Windows 8 interface and really bringing all these devices together um, is very, very important. And you need to remember this because while Microsoft, the reason I'm, I'm kind of showing you all this and the point I want to make is while Microsoft has made a big bet that consumers want the same experience across all the devices, it's even more important for you as application developers to create applications that are unique but behave in the same way so that users understand that when they swipe their finger down they're selecting something when they swipe left or right that your application behaves a certain way that your applications are simple and easily discoverable and those are some of the principles that I'm going to go through today and kind of talk to you about while we go through a little bit of a demo of, of Windows 8. So I'm going to show you kind of how Windows 8 behaves on, on my computer that I'm using right now. Uh, so I'm going to show you a little bit about that. Obviously, if we were live, I'd, I'd show you on a, on a slate device and we could kind of, I could prop it up and kind of show you. But just to save time, I'm going to show you just a live demo kind of right on my screen here. So we'll go right into a quick little demo here. And I'll just show you some of the basics uh, with, with Windows 8. Uh, so Windows 8 is phenomenal. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, my start screen. Very easy to get to it. You just you hit the start button and away you go. Um, you'll see a lot of the applications I have set up is you know my email just automatically magically starts kind of coming in, showing me the latest emails that have come up. Um, any Facebook posts are just completely synchronized, showing me people that are commenting on my pictures. I have uh, my stock markets all set up so I can kind of see can right away at a glance. I can have this running on one of my screens and it'll automatically show me kind of how stocks are performing, portfolio and things like that. Uh, anything that's internet connected right now is going to be much slower than usual just so you know because uh, obviously I'm streaming this across uh, a couple hundred computers right now so uh, you'll kind of see. So, so yeah, as you kind of scroll through these applications you're going to kind of notice that a lot of them behave uh, the same way. Um, in the sense that you know you have a nice beautiful picture here, you have nice text, uh, you have a, just at a snapshot view kind of how the markets are performing. Not so terribly good day today. Um, and you can kind of see, looks like it's red across the board right now. Uh, so I'm glad I don't have anything on the stock market today. Uh, and you can also go to news as well. You can kind of keep scrolling. Uh, or if I'm using touch, I can just use touch and kind of shift over to the side and I can watch videos and things like that. Um, at the same time, if I just hit the, uh, the start button, I go right back to the, to the main screen so you can see that. Um, the store is very, very cool. Uh, let me just go into that quickly. The store loads up here and kind of shows me everything within the store at a, at a spotlight level. Um, I can also see you know, games that are quite popular right now. And I'll tell you, the amount of applications that are appearing on the store now are just incredible. There's so many out there that you know, this is going to be the predominant way that people are going to be getting uh, applications moving forward. Um, if we go to social, all the social you know, applications that you would want are on here. Uh, Netflix, you can install Netflix. I mean, WWE has an app for this stuff. I mean, there's, everything is on here. And it's very easy to browse, uh, browse the store. Um, so let's say, for example, I wanted to you know, install Netflix. I would just basically click on onto Netflix, it would tell me, you know, you don't own the app, I would just hit install and it would start installing it for me. In this case, I've already installed it. The nice thing about Netflix is it actually allows me, if I'm watching a show, I'm not going to load it because my kids mostly use Netflix and the last demo I did, I loaded it and I think we had like Mulan or, or something or 
Teletubbies. I have no idea. Loaded it up, and we started playing that, and the whole crowd was laughing at me. So I'm not going to do any more live Netflix demos ever again, although it was quite funny. Um, but Netflix is neat because it uses Azure and things like that. They've been using uh, they use the Silverlight technologies, which are still there in the back end to stream video. Uh, so it's a really cool story to tell to show people how you know if I pause a TV show at home, I can load it up on my device at you know at work. Hit play, watch a little bit of it, you know, maybe go on the plane, I got some time, load it up on my Windows 8 phone, and hit play again, and it kind of just continually streams no matter where I'm at. It's a very, very cool application. Uh, Amazon as well, same thing. If I'm reading an Amazon Kindle book, I want to install Amazon. Again, it's quite simple. Um, the other nice thing is, I'll show you a little tip here, is that if you do have Windows 8, you can actually type at any point, and it automatically does a search for you. So, for example, if I type in Amazon, it'll automatically just load up and show me Amazon within the store. Uh, so I just hit Amazon, just pressed enter, shows me the Amazon app here that I haven't installed yet, you know, just hit install, and it'll start installing uh, the, app, the application in the background for me. So it's a really, really easy way is just, you know, start typing and things will automatically come up for you. Um, if I want to go back, I can hit back. If I want to go forward, I can hit forward. I can read details. I can look at the reviews for the application. And at any point, I can just hit the Windows key. Same thing on the start screen is if you hit the, the start button, you can start typing right away. So for example, say I want to run the app called Cut the Rope. And I hit Cut the Rope, and Cut the Rope comes up, which is a neat little game. I click on that, and it just loads up automatically for me. Very easy to use. Uh, and again, you're going to want to implement these things in your applications as well. So if you have a data application, or if you're writing a game, or whatever it is, uh, you're going to want to make sure that you implement the same features in your app so that people understand kind of what's coming. So I'm just going to hit yes here. And you'll notice the game kind of comes up. I can hit play. And I'm not sure how well it's streaming, uh, but I just really wanted to show you the game real quickly here. You can load up the game. And it starts teaching you, right? It starts teaching you right away kind of how, how the game should work. Um, so I go ahead and hit next. And I can see, you know, I'm going to cut certain ropes at certain times, try and get the most stars as possible. You know, I did not do well there, right? So you kind of see how that works. So that's kind of how that game works. I won't kind of keep going through all of them. There's a ton of different games on here, but... Uh, you know, really important for you to see kind of how you can, you know, install the applications, launch them very quickly. Um, one more thing I was going to kind of show you is just a little bit about selecting different tiles on the screen, uh, as well as maybe show you a little bit about uh, the sharing things that you can do. So, for example, let me go back into the screen here. Um, let me show you my music. So, again, I have a music pass. So, basically, what that means is I can play any song I want without having to pay for anything, So, which is beautiful. I mean, I already have Xbox at home, so I'm already paying for that. So, basically, I already have the music, and what I can do is I can just select any song I want. So, for example, say I want to hear some Bon Jovi. So, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, just type in Bon Jovi, uh, go over the side here. Uh, sorry, my mouse, I was on the wrong screen, so I'm going to have to hover over. Try again here. Music. So I can go like play artist, this artist for example, if I want to start a new DJ, or if I want to just try, let's try here, there we go. Okay, for some reason I think the streaming isn't allowing me to kind of load up the artist I want, but let me just, for example, go over to, I don't know, parental advisory, this will be good, hopefully there's no one under 13 on this call. I'm going to go ahead and hit play album, or I could play, you know, whatever song I want, it would play the album right through the speakers, um, so very easy to kind of you know, basically play music out of the, the Music Explorer. In order to pin applications, it's quite easy. Uh, all you need to do is just right-click on the application. So, for example, here is, uh, you know, the Kindle app. If I right-click on it, I selected it. I can unpin this app from the menu just by doing that, and it's completely gone. Um, if I wanted to add it in again, I would just, as before, I could type in, for example, Kindle, and the app would come up. I can right-click it and say, pin to the Start menu. In which case, uh, now if I go back to my start menu, you'll notice the application will be kind of on the side here. Very easy to grab these applications. You can just hold the hold your finger on it, and as soon as you hold it, it kind of pops out of the screen. Uh, so you can grab the application and kind of move it wherever you want, which is kind of neat. At the same time, a neat feature is, especially if you have lots of apps, is you can just use two fingers and kind of swipe in and out and kind of pull out, and it'll let you kind of see all the apps at one time. 
So now I can actually just go ahead and move over right away, and kind of put put it you know wherever I want. I could create a new whole section for maybe reading books and things like that. I can move the the news app into here as well, and I kind of start coming up with a, you know a neat little way that you know, I can kind of see how how all these things kind of go together. Maybe pull this one over as well. Um, and again, right clicking on uh, applications gives you these things at the bottom, the lo a little notification area that kind of flies in from the bottom up, so kind of gives you context in terms of what you can do. Because the nice thing about this new modern user interface is it's very clean. There's nothing on the screen, uh, but as soon as I right click on it, things come alive. So at the bottom, for example, I can see I can uninstall the application, I can make it smaller so that it's more of a square, uh, and again, if I right click on it again, I can make it larger if I want. I could even turn off the live tile feature. So, for example, say you know you got email here that you don't want people to see. Um, maybe you're in a not in a private area at that time. Uh, you can turn off the live tile updating, and then they'll just go to the mail option for you. And that way, you're kind of hiding whatever is you know behind the scenes there. Um, Here's a funny one. So people are talking about the live thing that we're doing right now. It's just coming in live right away. So here's Jonathan. I think I saw someone else commenting on the picture that I had on my Facebook page showing a John Maxwell book. Um, so again, really, really interesting. The, the thing I love about the modern user interface is that it's so live. It's so fresh. It kind of comes alive. And all the applications are just amazing. Some of the apps here, like Fresh Paint, just so cool. I don't have time to show it to you, but if you're using, again, a touch screen, it's one of the best touch paint applications I've ever seen. The amount of pressure you put on it makes the art look different. It's just, just phenomenal. So some of the neat features that I kind of showed you, just to recap, are being able to just start typing to find applications. Uh, so again, whatever it is that you're looking for, whether it's Facebook Touch, uh, whether it's Bing, doesn't matter what it is, you can search for it. Um, for example, you know, if I wanted to type, uh, load up Skype, I could load up Skype, I could load up SkyDrive, whatever it is that I want, go back to the main menu again. Uh, very, very easy to do things like that. So those are just some of the quick little features that I wanted to show you. I'm going to head back to my, uh, to my um, demo here, just in one sec. I'll go back to desktop in one second. Alrighty. Great. So just a little bit more on that. So I think you can kind of appreciate, hopefully, kind of what Windows 8 gives you with that whole new kind of fast and fluid kind of user experience with that whole start screen. Um, everything really kind of seems a little bit more responsive to me with Windows 8, which is very, very important that you kind of re remember when you build your applications. Uh, and ensuring that your applications are immersive and kind of full screen, drawing attention very specifically to the interactive elements of your application. Um, what we talk about a lot is touch first with a full keyboard and mouse support is when you're designing applications for that Windows 8 kind of user interface, you need to remember that touch is the main thing. When people are in this screen, ideally they're going to be using a touch device that they can actually touch. If you ever walk up to a computer that is running this screen, the first thing people are going to want to do is kind of touch it with their hand. Uh, which is fantastic, um, but at the same time, you do have to worry about mouse and keyboard, although the reality is you don't. Um, so that is kind of the key point. The key point is that touch is important. Keyboard and mouse kind of comes with it baked in. And it is a little, like for example, the right clicks are very much like a, t like a flick down. Uh, right click again is a flick down again. Uh, holding with your mouse you know, allows you to pull it off, just like touching with, the, with your finger would allow you to pull off the application. So everything kind of is, works kind of like what you would expect it to. So it, it's very, very easy. Swiping in from the left kind of does the same thing as moving your mouse over to the left. Swiping in from the right kind of does the same thing as putting your mouse at the bottom right corner. So you get all these different element, elements and things like that. Um, so works really, really well. Um, so again, key point there is, you know, worry about touch and just kind of expect that the full keyboard and the full mouse support will kind of be there for you. Um, a lot of the applications uh, are kind of meant to work together. Um, so when you're doing things like, you know, reading something on a new site, and if you have the Wikipedia application installed as an example, um, you can actually get very, very contextual uh, searches done right from within your app. So let me show you how that works. Let me just go into the store again. I was going to try and do this live. I forgot that the internet might be slow, but let me just show you how this will work. It's a very neat uh, demo here. I'm just going to type in wiki, and we should have the Wikipedia app kind of pop up here. Uh, so Wikipedia comes up, oops, that's Wikipedia Plus. So Wikipedia comes up here, I'm going to hit install, and it should install that application for me in the background. 
And what I can do now is once that application has been installing, um, what I can do is when I highlight text in a specific application, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be cool if when I highlighted some text in, let's say, the news application, say something I didn't understand, I could do a search right away within, within Wikipedia. So let me load up news here. Let's find a news article. Right, so welcome to Bing News. Again, full screen, fully immersive, you know, big picture, just like the stock market application. And if I scroll over to the side, you kind of see other uh, things within the pictures and things like that. So let me uh, go ahead and, you know, click on one of these things. Let's say, let's try and find something more technology related. Uh, say cell phones here. Uh-oh, this is a video. I don't want to look at video. As you can see, video actually works pretty well as well. Kind of gives you the whole touch screen here. You can actually scroll with your finger, which works really, really well. And uh, yeah, you can kind of do a, a whole slew of things right from within this application. Let me find something without video, though. Let's say, uh, let's try and click this one. So here's some text. Let's say that I don't want to know more about the Oakland Bay Bridge, right? So I'll just select Oakland Bay Bridge. And if I hover over to the side here and I go over to my contextual uh, icons, I can actually take this and share that with Wikipedia and Wikipedia will go ahead and do a search for on what I selected so here it's gonna go ahead and do a search I don't know how fast this is gonna go here but it's gonna do a search on the bridge and it's gonna show me kinda contextual information specifically about the area that I selected um, so again whatever you're in whatever application you're in you can actually share the contacts with with other applications as well so it works really really nicely and cleanly and as well, the experience is the same across all devices and architectures. So it doesn't matter what type of computer or PC you're running. Windows 8 will install on it. As long as it's a PC, it'll run. It'll respond the same way. If it has touch enabled, you'll get touch uh, baked into it. If you don't have touch, you can use the mouse and the keyboard. Uh, you know, you take your Windows phone. Windows phone behaves the same way. Uh, Xbox is getting there as well. With your latest update, actually, it's pretty much there. It's phenomenal. It almost behaves exactly like the, the modern UI you would see on Windows 8. So all of those experiences are kind of uh, baked in there together. So it works really, really nicely. So let's talk a little bit now that you kind of get the background designing Windows uh, Store applications. Um, so just some of the you know basic principles I'm going to go through with you today uh, real quick are the pride and craftsmanship, uh, being fast and fluid, uh, authentically digital, trying to do more with less, uh, winning as one. These are kind of the key principles that Microsoft talks about when creating great user experiences. Uh, the reason these are important is it kind of gives you a little bit to focus on. I recommend if you have a pen and paper and you're planning on writing applications, don't just kind of throw these to the side and think, okay, well, it's just marketing stuff because I'll, I'll tell you, I've been writing applications for almost 15 years and the big difference from now to 15 years ago is you need to make sure you worry about the user experience. You can no longer just write applications and be happy that they compile and build and work. The, the world has changed. Uh, you need to make sure that there is a lot of value there, not just perceived value, but value that people become immersed into your application because they work fast and they're fluid, because they are digital and you can share and win is one because you can share across other applications and you can do a lot more with, with, with less on the screen, less screen real estate. I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. So the key message, pride and craftsmanship. Don't just put on an app because you got to put on an app. Put out an app because you're proud of it. You think it adds some value. And the app might look really, really simple. You know, I actually put out uh, a number of apps over the last few weeks, and a lot of them are very, very simple. Um, one of them that I made, honestly, was just for my kids. Uh, we made one called Animal Sounds. And my kids are just, you know, I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old, and they love just pushing on different things and seeing what sounds they make, right? So I've made complicated apps before, and they've had a couple hundred downloads. This Animal app, took me about three hours to make. I put it into the App Store. It has almost 4,000 downloads as of a week ago. Um, and again, it's just an Animal Sounds app. It's just a cool little app that kind of shows you different animals. You hit the button and it makes the sound of the animal. My kids love it. So as long as you make an application uh, that kind of really hones in on something, you know, that's really the best place to start. So let's talk a little bit about that. The first step to designing a great app, and it says it's right on the screen, is create what am I best at, right? And I tell people this a lot. What are you, what are you best at, but what is your app best at? Um, if you don't know the answer to this question, you probably shouldn't be creating an app. So there might be you know, other transit applications out there already, but 
can you make an app that is better than the transit apps out there? And I'll say, you know, I actually put a couple transit apps, and the reason I put them out was because there was some transit apps out there, but they were super complicated. And the reality is, if someone's using a transit application, they're probably five minutes from missing their bus already. So they want to be able to click on a button, have the app detect where they are, tell them when the next bus is coming for their specific location. And on top of that, they don't want to select what city, country they're in. They want to install the app that works just for their specific city. And that's all. They never want to see anything else. So I created an app for that. Um, again, my app was going to be the best at providing transit information for Winnipeg. So that's what my app is the best at. Does it provide um, you know, additional weather information? No. Does it provide you know, um, best music to listen to? No. Does it tell you when the next Winnipeg Jets game is? No. Would that add value around it? Sure. But those are the old days. In the old days of applications, you wanted to create as many things as you could in an app, throw in some cool toolbars. Everyone wanted the weather somewhere in their application. That's the days of the past. Days of the future, the day of today, is to try and make things that are the best at one thing. So remember this statement, if you forget everything else, when you write an application, what is your app best at? And write that down. Let me give you an example of some applications that are best at certain things. So here's an example of cocktail flow. Cocktail Flow is the, if you haven't tried it before, I guarantee you should go install it right now. It's an amazing application. You can put in kind of what you have in your cabinet and it'll tell you what drinks you can make. And at the same time, if you're ever in a restaurant and you don't know, you know what to order, or you want to sound fancy or whatever it is, and you want to know what the ingredients are, how to make it, because as soon as you tell someone a drink, you don't want to look silly and not know how to make it if they don't know what it is. So in this application, you can sort by color, you can sort by drink, you can sort by brand, a whole bunch of different things. I won't go through the app, we're running short on time, but you can actually go ahead and say, this app, Cocktail Flow, is the best at allowing you to find the best drink, right? Great app at that, and if you have time, go check it out. The weather app, right, Bing Weather, is the best at telling you the weather. It shows you the weather, and that's it, right? Doesn't show you anything else. Shows you an hourly forecast, shows you the temperature, shows you the date, what, what time, how it's, how it's going to look like. That's all it does. It just shows you the weather. This is the weather for Mississauga. Here's another example of um, another application. This is the Bing Maps application, right? It's the best application at mapping. It allows you to zoom in and zoom out with your mouse uh, or your finger, which works great. You hold down the control key, you zoom in and out with your with your scroll in the middle of the mouse, it zooms in and out, works with any, anything you want. You can add pins, you can show traffic, you can add different map styles, location, you hit a button, it detects with Wi-Fi and GPS where you are. Uh, again, it is the best application at mapping. Phenomenal application that you should check out. But again, it is the best at something. Um, so it is incredibly important for you to remember that when you create applications, that you try and make applications that are the best at something. So let's, just as an example, um, right now, if you are thinking of an application that you're, de you're planning on developing, and if you're in this workshop today, then I'm assuming you have something in mind. Um, while I continue to move forward with the presentation, because we don't have time to pause here, I want you to write down you know, one sentence, you know, and be very specific in terms of what it is. What is your application the best at? And in some cases, when I've done this presentation live, some people will say, well, Actually, my, my app isn't the best at anything. It's, it's good at all of these different things. And what I tell people is, well, maybe you should rethink what it is that you're doing and maybe try and think of a different application or take one of those things and maybe make multiple applications. Uh, because, again, it's so, so important to make an application that is the best at one thing. Now, in some cases, you might have multiple ideas uh, that you know make that one app, but at the same time, those might be features that you might add later on. And... In the next section here called Content Over Chrome, I want to show you exactly how you would go about and adding the same features and functionality that you might have in an application five years ago in an application today, but keeping everything much more simple, very touch friendly, very simplistic, and appeasing to the eye. So again, if you have some time in the next little bit here, write out right now, you know, um, if I could, I'd tell you to stop the video, but you, you can't. Um, write out one sentence in terms of what is your app the best at. Very, very important that you do that. Okay, I'm going to move on. Content over Chrome. What does this all mean? Um, I used to have a, a slide on here because of recording it, I took it out because I didn't know the, the imagery where it was from. But 
you know, back in you know the 50s and the 60s, when when the car manufacturers, you know, were really trying to take things to the next level and you know sell you know a car for more money, you know, this whole Chrome thing came out. That's where Chrome came out of, by the way. Uh, this whole Chrome, Chrome, Chrome. And the reality about content over Chrome is, back in the day, what they were trying to do is sell cars for more money. So what they did is they started chromatizing everything, right? They would add nice chrome rims to the wheels. They would add chrome to the bumper. Uh, they would add chrome to the handles. And as a joke on one of my screens, I had a, I used to have a, I think it was an Aston Martin that was completely covered in chrome. And at the end of the day, if you go crazy with chrome, your car ends up looking absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I would, you know, gather that cars with too much, even a little Chrome, kind of look ridiculous anyway. Um, so content over Chrome. Chrome isn't that important. It's really what's under the hood, right? It's how your car drives. Is your seat comfortable? Um, do you have power steering? Uh, do you have great tires? Um, is your car safe? You know, do you have airbags? Mind you, I, I'm a dad now with two kids, uh, and the, the reality is that stuff is more important to me. But, you know, Chrome is nice, but, but at the end of the day, it's not functional. Um, and it causes a lot of distractions. Um, so we need to be really careful when we build modern applications um, that we shy away from the Chrome. Um, here's a great example of an app. Take a look at it. It's basically, you know, take a guess. You can probably guess right away if you look at the top left corner. It's basically the old kind of news application, the old news reader, right? Um, how did it work? Well, you would add RSS feeds, right? You could obviously click on this button here. Uh, you can add additional RSS feeds uh, to this list um, here, and then you know they basically pop up on the right. You can kind of see all the different headlines, kind of all aggregated in. Um, you know, Google has a news reader that looks kind of just like this, right? You add a ton of different RSS feeds into it, uh, then it kind of gives you all the different headlines, and you can read them and whatnot and search. I never liked it in the first place, but this this is like a traditional old application, right? Especially in you know, say an old ERP application. Um, time attendance application, whatever it is, applications used to behave, and a lot of them still do, you know, look like this, right? You have your, all these different things. People would install controls and try and make them fancy and, you know, list view and detail view and all these different options to, you know, refresh the screen, you know, additional settings. Um, you could click in on one of these items and maybe sort by headline, sort by date. Uh, then once you click on it, you know, maybe the actual, uh, what you want to read comes up, maybe the next unread, you know, page one of two, all 14 feet showing. I mean, there's just a ton of information on here, just so much information. But how much of it is really relevant? How much does it need to be there right away? What it, I'll ask you right now, you know, what is the most important element in all of this? Why do I go into a news application, right? I go into a news application to read the news, right? But yet, like, out of the entire area of the screen, how much of it can I actually read is, is very, very little um, because the rest of the screen is filled with all this other information. Uh, and the problem is that Chrome really, you know, distracts users from what the application is the best at. Um, so you need to be really, really careful that, you know, the content is really the most important element of the entire user experience. And you need to make sure that you kind of, you know, leave all of those elements uh, that are only, only critical to the existing user experience uh, there for you. Um, so you just need to make sure that you kind of try and solve for the distractions and not for just not for discover, not, sorry, uh, not discoverability. So what you really want to do is ensure that people kind of become really immersed and what they love and kind of explore everything else, right? They'll figure everything else on their own. What they want to see is what are the news, what are the images, and you know, later on I might want to know how to add some more RSS feeds and things like that. But you know, I can do that, I can figure that out fairly, fairly easily. Um, so, you know, where did Chrome come from? And I talked to you a lot about it before in terms of a car, but really it came from things like navigation, right? You need to be able to navigate. Uh, through the application. Uh, you need to be able to see the layout, right? So Chrome came from layout, the ability to have the borders and the side elements so you can resize things uh, up and down, um, as well as, you know, the reality is that it commands you to kind of interact with all these elements. So instead of sitting there on your couch, you know, just reading the news, you're going to start clicking on buttons and things that distract you and things that don't actually add anything to the actual value of reading the news, which is why you see so many applications kind of going this very simplistic uh, way.
Uh, so just talking a little bit more about that, you know, in terms of navigation, you know, Vue should be more about kind of, you know, not necessarily about kind of, um, kind of what you're looking at, but more about the content, right? Uh, not about all the different places your user could go for. So for example, when you litter your entire user interface with tabs and list all the places a user can navigate in your app, you lose all those pixels uh, for the contextual content. So when designing apps for the Windows Store, uh, you can actually make the content itself more navigatable by removing all those navigation elements. And I'm going to show you how that works in the new news application in a couple of seconds here. Um, so you can really kind of get rid of the whole navigation experience of your application. You never have to worry about navigation again, about back and next and forward, because all those elements are kind of taken care of for you, and you can fill those contextual areas with whatever it is that you want. Um, so let's take a look at a new news application here. I'm going to load up the navigation for the news. Um, so I'm just load up news here. And once it loads up, you'll notice that, you know, again, like I mentioned before, the big kind of image pops in, flies in to the screen. Let me, let me load that up here quickly. And again, the internet could be a little bit laggy here, but once it loads up, you're going to probably see a nice big picture of New York, New York. Um, and again, so this is the news, right? So I can click in here. I can, oops, I actually wanted to Bing Travel, which is why I'm like, why Why is there no news? Uh, but again, this is a great example as well. You know, I'm just going to leave it in here. Uh, so here's an example of Bing Travel, right? What, what do I, if I'm in a travel application, right? And it's good that we chose this by fluke because you'll see, right? I don't see a lot of text. I, I, what do I see? I see the different locations where I could travel to. If I scroll over, I can see some featured destinations. I can see some flights, hotels I might want to search, some really cool panoramas. Right here's a cool panorama of Chicago. I can click on the panorama control. Panorama loads up. Again, what do you see on the screen? Do you see uh, Chrome? You know, other than the big Chrome ball in the middle, which is why I click this. Um, do you see any Chrome? No. Right? You don't see any navigation elements. You don't see all. All you see is a little back button here. Uh, and if I click over, I can kind of go through and kind of experience what I want to experience, right? So using a touch finger, I can just kind of go through kind of experience what it would be like to be here. I loads very, very quickly, and the longer I stay on a specific image, right, downloads additional information, additional data, kind of makes it look better and better. And, you know, it just works really, really well. A really, really nice interface. I want to see the news right from here. I keep going. Right, top nine experiences in Tanzania, Tasmania. I can click in, loads up. Again, the news loads up. Do you see any Chrome? Not really, right? All you see is maybe a little contextual as I move my mouse. You'll notice that the little arrows come up on the side so that I know that I need to click them. But other than that, like there's nothing there on the screen, right? I just hold my mouse still for a second. You'll notice I can start reading right away. Very, very immersive. So, so how do I navigate on this application, right? How would I navigate? Well, if I right click, now all of a sudden all these things happen, right? Now all of a sudden you see at the top I have you know, travel, home, destination, flights, hotels, back to the web, you know, featured. I can click on flights as a drop down. I can see all the different element selections. I can see at the bottom, you know, navigation for a previous article, next article. I can change text size, text style, how I want the RSS feed reader to read. Um, so yeah, it's very, very simple and I can just click through it and I can read elements. So all the navigation is kind of baked in uh, to just the ability to right click. Now, if I was using a touch device, if I were just to swipe from the top port from the top and just swipe down, this navigation element would pop up. And then at the bottom, if I swipe up, again, people say, well, people don't know how to do that. Well, the reality is, you know what? People didn't know how to hold down a finger and wait until a selection happened. So people, people will learn on their own, and they'll experience how these things work. And they'll learn how to you know, contextually select things and all those types of things. So very, very easy to kind of navigate. Um, if I go over you know, to the sports news, for example, sports news would come up. Again, same elements. Let's go over to news for a second here. Go back. I can see different things again, right? Um, if I go back in here, I can right click. And again, same thing, right? I got the news at the top. I can select sources. If I want to see sources for news, I can add additional sources for news right through here. And, you know, I can go ahead and just, you know, keep exploring the application and, you know, it makes it very easy to, to explore applications by using this method. Um, so let me just go back here. So that kind of gives you a good example of kind of navigation. Now layout, 
is very important as well. Creating a visual clarity, you know, that's very, very important with your application. So you can kind of see how you should behave. You know, in the Windows Store app, they actually use a lot of this content itself and they use the same grid, you know, to lay out things like prints and web pages to avoid a lot of that Chrome. So when you're browsing through the store itself, you can kind of see that. So by eliminating a lot of that Chrome layout, you know, the content is really what provides the structure and the layout. You understand what I'm saying? So because there's no layout, so let me just go to the store and show you. There's no layout on this store, right? It's there's no like, you know, splitting things up. It's just the apps. It's the apps themselves, right? The app themselves are creating that layout for you, right? It looks really nice. You can tell this is the store, um, but again, there's no you know Chrome on here or things like that. Now, if again, if I right click, I can see my apps or I can go home to the store. Uh, but other than that, you know, there's really nothing else, right? I can see at the top right corner here, there's maybe updates, right? So I can click updates. I'm not going to run them now, but you can kind of see all the apps. I can go ahead and update them if I wanted to. And again, I could go back here now because I've selected things. So they, the context menus come up. And uh, very easy to kind of navigate through all these different elements. So, you know, layout, you know, is very, very important. And, you know, remove all those lines. In the old apps, again, you used to have lines separating things and, you don't need that anymore. People can tell when there's when you know there's a differentiating thing with, with your applications. Just like on this, there's no I can tell this is a different set of applications, right? I can tell especially if I if I zoom in and out, I can tell oops, let me go back here. I can tell, you know, that there's different kind of layers here. So I could, you know, for example, name this group, right? Name this as, you know, main group. And go ahead and you know, say name that. And I could go ahead and, you know, name this group as, you know, I don't know, books. It's very easy. And then if I scroll back in, I can kind of see my different selections and different categories. So very, very easy to kind of navigate. If there's no line needed here to differentiate between main and books, um, it's very, very clear and very done, kind of done for you, right? So as long as you lay things out correctly with the layout, you know, which I'll show you in a bit, um, very, very important to kind of just remove those lines, remove the boxes. All those group boxes that kind of came with Visual Studio, people always used to just drop those in all over the place. Sometimes I would be working on applications, I'd go into a company, and I'd see, you know, a, a group box with another group box and another group box with different shades of gray. And I was like, why is there so many different layers here? You know, you don't need any of that anymore. Make it very, very simple. Um, and give that content that breathing room, you know, through the use of real intentional space. So you have that nice space, even on the screen right now. It's just a gray screen with some, you know, text. It's not the most beautiful PowerPoint slide ever, but again, it looks clean because I'm using the right typography, I'm using the right spacing, and it's not a mess. It's easy on the eyes, easy to read. So um, I'm not gonna. I'm just to save some time because we're running short on time. I'm not gonna go through uh, the demo of, of music itself, but music again, kind of you know, works very, very well. I kind of showed you the video. You can scroll through music and layout and things like that. So layout, incredibly important uh, uh, to focus on. Uh, in terms of interaction, you know, allowing things uh, to work very well, you know, leveraging the edge of the screen so that when you, you know, move your mouse into different corners that things pop up, you know, incredibly important. You know, um, app commanding used for launching uh, the different scenarios, like adding the new RSS feed, for example, or common interactions such as like the search bar, um, are completely gone now from the Windows Store. You know, a lot of times you can hover over and kind of see, but you know, you can just go ahead and kind of type, and things kind of interact. Um, so it's important that you make that content, you know, itself really easy to navigate and interact with, and just tap with, um, you know, to select different things. And the other thing that's really important is that. A lot of commands that used to litter the screen, like little buttons or drop down things or things like that, they kind of stay away in general with, with the kind of the new modern UI elements. Um, so really those only come in when you start right clicking or selecting things um, or going into those types of uh, modes as well. Um, so again, those things are kind of important. So um, just again, kind of show you again, I kind of showed this already, but interaction, you know, if I flip down on an icon, it selects it. If I flick again, it unselects it. Uh, right? If I you know, zoom out, I go out. If I zoom in, I go in. Um, you know, these things are very natural in behavior. If I select and move, you know, I don't have to, like on other competing devices, you know, how, how do people even re know, like I said, that you have to hold down and select to move something, right? That would usually select the application. Um, so what we do is you just basically grab it and you just move it wherever you want. 
Um, and it's very, very natural, very easy to, to kind of see. Um, again, if you go to the store icon, right, if I select anything, like for example, let's select one of these photo applications, right, photo comes up, um, very simple to kind of just navigate through uh, and select things. Um, you know, the weather application, as I showed before, uh, the weather application, again, the same thing. Um, once this loads up here, now notice like when it comes up here, I can see the weather right away, and if I right click, right, other things come up. Interactive elements, like kind of flies in as well, right? Kind of shows you that something new is there, right? And shows you, you know, change to Fahrenheit if I want. Uh, I can check my current location. I can refresh the screen. I can get weather from different places. Uh, but again, otherwise, you know, very, very clean, very simple to use. I can select the date if I want to get more information on specific days. Again, there's no, you know, separating elements as we've talked before to bring things together. Um, you know, nice spacing used across the board, historical weather. You know, very clean, very immersive uh, interface uh, that you can use. So very important to, to follow that. All right, so we're almost near the end here. Uh, talk a little bit about pride and craftsmanship. Um, and really, I, I like to show this instead of just kind of talking about it. So just to show you a little bit about pride and craftsmanship. Laying things out correctly is critically important. Now, if you use uh, Blend or if you use uh, Visual Studio, uh, Blend is actually being baked into Visual Studio now, you know, and you can even download templates for all of these applications. So if you're going to go ahead and design an application, if you already installed Visual Studio, you actually get uh, a pack that gets added into PowerPoint that allows you to create user experiences within PowerPoint uh, visually so you can kind of come up with the user experiences before you actually code anything. Uh, which is very, very cool. I need to mock up the interfaces. I don't have time to get into that today, uh, but again, it's just something else you might want to check out or, or, uh, or, or Bing later to kind of learn more about. I'll give you some more information on that later as well. Uh, but using these layouts and the grids that kind of come outside the box, come uh, with the box, are very, very important uh, because you need to ensure that you use the right pixel separation. Um, you can't just throw things randomly on these grids. In order for things to look good uh, without any differentiating factors, you really need to align to the grid. So really using that grid, uh, using the, using it as a silhouette is, is very, very important to kind of get that clean, kind of readable elements to all your applications. Um, and alignment of that content is very, very, very important. And so here's an example of you know an application. Again, if you just create an application out of the box, you actually get this out of the box. So you're going to get something like this. Don't go ahead and kind of rearrange things because you want to. Um, everything is important. Everything that's been designed is incredibly important. The spacing between, let me see if I can, there we go. The spacing in between, you know, app and group title has been done for a reason. The spacing on the left side has been done for a reason. If you break these elements, it will feel unnatural to users and they won't know how to use your application as easily as they should. Again, you can provide different elements. You can lay things out so differently. I mean, here's an example of another layout that we were doing, right? Um, and you might say, well, then all apps are going to look the same. So you know, I don't want to do this. Well, actually, they don't all look the same. Let me show you some examples. Here's an example of, uh, of a bakery application. Uh, so here's an example of, you know, just a couple of cupcakes and different things like that. Um, you can kind of see they all kind of look different, and I'm getting really hungry now because in Winnipeg, it's lunchtime. I haven't had lunch yet. Um, so you can kind of see all these different elements, and uh, yeah, it looks really, really cool. But again, they've kind of kept with the layout, right? The layout's the same, the spacing's the same, uh, it looks different, but they've kept with the layout, right? They've kept with that grid, right? Every single one of you, you're gonna go into Visual Studio, you're gonna create a new application, you're gonna get that grid, use the grid, okay, use the grid, very important. Here's another example of Contoso sandwich truck. Now you're gonna go, whoa, 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 this looks a little bit different, and it is a little bit different, but I'm gonna show you how it looks, it's slightly different, but it still conforms to the grid. Again, still using the grid elements, still showing not just traditional icons, still showing images with data, right? So we're showing the lunch specials of a heater app for $8.95. Um, so right there, we're actually showing star ratings right below it as well. Uh, Ruben with a Swiss cheese sandwich, I think that's what I'm going to go buy later. Uh, again, three star, uh, you know, looks really, really good, very impressive. Uh, where you can find them, next location. Now here they shifted things a little bit which is okay, you're allowed to do that. I mean, you're allowed to do what, almost whatever you want. You might get declined in the store for various reasons, 
Um, but again, um, they've kind of stayed with the grid alignment, at least on the left. They've shifted a little bit uh, vertically, but horizontally, they've kept that spacing. Very important because when you swipe in and fly in, or when you start pinning things on the left, it's incredibly important that you leave that spacing there. And again, the spacing is a little bit off on the side here, but again, the, the most important areas uh, have remained the same. So I wanted to show you that. And there's so many more examples I could show you of other applications that all look different, right? All recipes, Hulu Plus, the store, Wikipedia. These are all very branded that if I did, if I even hid Wikipedia on here, you would know that was Wikipedia. Why? Right. It's the same grid, right, as the other ones, but how come you know? All recipes, same thing, right? It looks like all recipes, but it still be, conforms to the grid. Uh, Hulu Plus, again, looks like uh, conforming to the grid with the images and whatnot using the same Chrome features, but it's Hulu. Um, so you can make incredible applications while conforming to the Microsoft standards uh, within the application. So again, incredibly important that you follow the grid, stick to the grid, um, and stick to the layout uh, that we've kind of shown you there. Um, Typography is another important element, and Windows is kind of founded on, on the, the factors of typography, making things really clean and beautiful. And with Windows 8, they kind of took it to the next level with uh, this new Segoyo uh, UI elements. And there's different types, and I'm going to show you some of those. And they're incredibly important that you use these because, again, they add a whole other element uh, to your applications. You can go ahead and use whatever custom fonts you want. But I'll always tell people whenever they tell me, well, I want to use you know X Y Z font. I always ask them, well, why? Like, is it that important? Is your app gonna behave differently by using a different font? Well, you know, what is the most important? Is it for the people to read very easily, or is it for your app to look great? Right. I always say things need to behave very well, but at the same time look great. And to go to UI, I mean, they spent years trying to come up with the right font that people will, and you have no idea. Like, I've, I've had tours of Microsoft Research. The amount of research that has gone in to what font to use, what spacing to use, I mean, you're welcome to go and do your own research. Uh, but just know that if you just want to change something on a whim, just because you don't like, for example, 42 point font as the heading, and you don't like 20 point for readability, and 11 point for data, and 9 point for a little smaller, then what is your reasoning? Is it just because you don't think it looks good? Well, maybe the Microsoft research team uh, has done enough research that you should probably stick with it. And you can create your own unique applications anyway. As long as you stick to the Segoy UI and the grids, you can create your own unique applications. But it's very, very important that you stick to uh, the Segoy UI uh, for the elements that you need. Um, like I said already, page headers, subheaders, the body copy, um, all very, very important. And even other languages, Microsoft will automatically select the right language for you. So again, if you're overriding fonts, you're going to have a lot of issues with these types of things. So, um, so for example, like Chinese or Japanese or Korean or whatever it is that you're using, um, if you have an issue you know, with the font, you're going to have to worry about all these other things. So I always tell people, don't worry about the fonts, don't worry about the grids, Con conform to all those things and add the features, what's your application best at, be the best at that, and you're going to be incredibly successful. There's a demo that I could show you just about you know, how it works with different typography settings, but I'm, I'm going to kind of uh, skip that a little bit, and uh, we're just kind of going to move uh, a little bit ahead as well. I want to talk about being fast and fluid, and really uh, trying to make things that you know, really, really behave uh, as quickly as possible. Um, really, you know, motion is kind of more than just that kind of visual elements that you kind of see on a screen. It really kind of gives you information that you know you wouldn't get if you didn't see that that actual interaction point. That's why it's so hard, especially when you kind of create user experiences on paper uh, without kind of seeing how things function and work. It's very hard to know if a user is going to like it. Um, that's why I always talk about rapid prototyping in other presentations I give because rapid prototyping uh, and interactive prototyping really allows you to see you know what's going to happen between A and B and what happens between A and B is so so incredibly important, which is why the continuity through motion is so important. And um, that's really why I have to talk about a lot of the anim animation elements uh, that kind of occur with Windows and how important the UI controls that kind of come with you, uh, you know, that you use them uh, to actually create all these different things like the animation library that you can use. Uh, and it comes kind of preset already with all of the different things like the Windows Store, you know, swiping in and out and the right click menu. So again, I tell people, you know, especially if you're getting started, just use the animation library with all the different features that it has. Um, and then if you need to extend it, feel free. Uh, but that's really more of an advanced thing. I, I honestly, like I've seen a lot of applications out there already, like 
Hulu, Wikipedia, uh, Amazon Kindle Reader, you know, they, they use the animation library. So, you know, I, I always ask people, why are you kind of, uh, if you need to go away from it, why, why would you? Because there's so many already that are available to you that you can just use. You know, as an example, you know, here's uh, the keyboard kind of flying in, right? When you go into a box and you need to type, the keyboard flies in so you can start typing um, on that keyboard, you know, very easy to, to kind of use. Um, so again, a lot of these kind of elements kind of already uh, work here. So I, I was going to show you, but you've kind of already seen this as you go into the start menu and kind of things happen and how they fly in and out. So I'm not going to show you again. Um, so, um, so let's just go into kind of the ergonomics of touch. And usually I'll show this kind of live in presentation form, but hopefully this picture kind of shows you. Uh, the reality is that um, people are going to use the device in various ways. You're going to use it as a keyboard and a mouse connected on the desk. They're going to pick it up with two hands and two fingers and hold it. Um, they're going to put it on their lap and you know type on it. They're going to hold it like a book and maybe swipe up and down. And so depending on the application that you're building, you really need to understand kind of how all these things uh, flow and function and what are people going to do with them. And because the finger is really imprecise, um, and I say that on purpose, is imprecise, it's really, really important that you provide kind of instant feedback to the user and not wait till later on to kind of tell them what they've done. Um, so those are kind of things that are, you know, very important. So as an example, you know, click and drag in the start menu, you know, kind of gives you a lot of that functionality. So let me show you that real quick here. What I mean by that is, if I were, again, if I were to grab this button right away, you'll notice that even though it's slight, as soon as I kind of click or even if I were to hold down with my finger, it kind of, you'll see that it kind of looks like it's being pushed in a bit. And it's and it's and it's not just an um, it's not just happening at the same spot either. Like if I click on it on the side here, it's on the right. Notice that, right? So I can grab it. If it's in the middle, it kind of pushes it down a certain way. And if it's on the side here, it kind of pushes it in that way. So it's it's very natural. And it, and the whole idea is they're trying to kind of bring natural world into the UI world, right? It's not just like okay, click it and now you know X is all over all the icons and that means you can move things. It's, it's a very natural way of kind of saying, okay, I can move this icon. So ergonomics of touch are very, very important to kind of follow so that the applications kind of behave uh, in, in a certain way uh, for you. Um, again, simplifying the flow of how things work. You know, being fast and fluid is, is more than just how things look. So there's a lot of different decisions that you can make uh, based on the design to kind of help you uh, simplify that flow for a different user. So these are just some of those things, you know, like roam settings and preferences, um, you know, put config under settings contract, you know, saving application state, reducing and combining text input, um, showing errors right in line, you know, trying to, you know, get rid of additional interactive elements and making things very, very simplistic is, is incredibly, incredibly important so that you, your applications behave, you know, very well. And what we really want to do is kind of go beyond that whole, you know, physical metaphors of the old world and kind of bring in this new authentically digital methodology. So trying to think of things differently. Um, and that's really where you're going you're gonna to achieve the most with your applications. So, so what do I mean by that? really beyond physical metaphors. So embracing the fact that, you know, we are in a digital world, we are in a pixelated screen. Um, stop thinking about things as you would in the physical. And instead of kind of talking for five minutes on that slide, let me just show you what I mean. Um, so I grabbed these because I think these will give you a good example of what I mean. Let's say this is a science fiction, uh, you know, book collection that I have, right? And I want to maybe lay it out in a certain way. So here I have some adventure books. You know, here I have some anthologies that I've collected. Um, that's great, but you know, what if I could lay these things out differently? What if I want to see them differently? Because this way of looking at them, that's great. You know, here's my adventure books, here's my anthologies. But what if I want to see how many books do I have of a certain category? You know, I could sure I could add the number here. I could say maybe 37 adventure books and 100 anthologies, and so forth and so forth. But wouldn't it be great if I could see them in a different way? What if I could, you know, show them by popularity? So what if instead of having just a listing of all my screens, if I had a big splash screen at the front that showed me adventure, anthologies, high tech, history, and short stories, all with different bar graphs and things like that, so I could kind of see very easily kind of how things are. That's kind of showing you things a little bit differently and kind of going beyond that physical, you know, method to kind of showing you things in a different light. 
Um, I was going to show you the music app, but we're running short on time, so I'm going to skip that one as well. Um, the kind of last kind of couple slides here, I got like 10 more slides to go, and we're pretty much done for this uh, for this one today. Uh, is this whole thing about icons? So here's the old icons. I find it quite funny that these icons were like in the heyday. These were these were amazing, and people still you know spend so much time on you know you know buying an icon pack. You can buy icon packs for fifty dollars. You can buy icon packs for ten thousand dollars. I bought some of them for for specific cases, and uh, you know what? Like the reality is, they don't tell me what it is they really do. They don't give me any data. They don't tell me right away. Imagine if airports used icons like this to tell people where things were. Um, there, there's a reason they don't use those things. There's a reason they make things very, very simple. Is because these don't provide me any value. They, I can kind of tell this is a calculator. Sure, I can kind of tell this is a notepad, I guess, because I know now. I've been trained to know what these things mean. Uh, but if I wasn't trained, I'd be like, what is this? Is this a file sort? Is this a... A mail, like what is that? I don't even know what that is, right? Like, is this a calendar flip chart? I have no idea what app that is. I don't know what it'll do. Um, so things have changed a lot, and and really, what what Microsoft is really trying to push forward is using the new gleams, right? I can tell this is back plus add, you know, check something off, refresh, comment, you know, delete, favorite, rewind, fav, you know, uh, like, play, you know, favorite, you know, filter. You can tell what gleams mean, and they're very, very simple to, uh, to to look at, very easy to use. This is why if you go to an airport, a lot of things look very similar to what you're seeing on the screen right now, is because no matter what country, what nationality you're from, you can look at these things, you will know that you know that is the baggage terminal, or that is where you go grab your bags, or this is terminal B, terminal F, that is where the transportation is. Uh, there's a reason why they do things that way. Um, winning as one, uh, what, what this really means, winning as one, obviously a little bit of a marketing spin, but all this means is, remember when I was showing you that demo, I'm not going to show it to you again, uh, where you could select text in the news reader and then load up Wikipedia right from there to get context? Well, that is uh, winning as one. That means that what you do is you expose, uh, through contracts, you can expose your application to other applications. So applications can now work together. Um, you know, you could expose through search. Um, if you're in the medical field and you write a medical application, right, you can expose certain things, uh, certain data to other applications. You can even expose them just to your own applications if there's privacy issues, right? So ensuring that only your applications can share contacts together. You can have various teams within your organizations write applications that work together. Um, it's funny because before, you know, we used to use all these complicated APIs and things like that, and now, uh, using the sharing and the contracts, all these things are made much more simplistic. And there's some baked in and, and pre-made for you that you can leverage uh, that allow you to kind of use these things. And really the key point on this slide is one plus one really does equal three. You know, having two applications is powerful, uh, but if you can have two applications that talk together and work together, all of a sudden now you're getting a lot more power, a lot more bang for your buck. And some of the ones that are built into the contracts are the sharing, uh, the search, the settings, and, and the file picker. And I've kind of shown you a, a lot of those already, uh, so I'm not going to go through kind of all those for you again. Uh, but if you want to explore Windows 8, if you already have Windows 8, very easy to explore. Especially if you just hover on the side here, you're going to see right away, you're going to see a lot of those come up, like the settings, uh, devices. Uh, I actually use devices a lot when I'm at home. If I'm actually watching, um, I'm not going to... I really love showing this demo at home, but uh, you'll notice I have Xbox Smart Class here. I can load that up at home. It detects uh, my Wi-Fi that I'm at home, and I can control my Xbox right from my Windows 8 PC. Uh, at the same time, if I'm running the music app or if I'm playing any video uh, on my PC, I double-click on it, and I just want to watch it on my TV screen now, I go to Devices, and if I were to click on it at home, it'll show me Xbox, and I just say Xbox, and it'll browse any video that I'm playing, loads it up immediately onto my my device at home, whatever my Xbox is connected to. So I don't have to worry about wiring different things up or you know creating new whatever. I don't have to do anything. I just basically go to devices and I share it right there. So uh, a lot of really cool things you can do uh, with the Windows 8 uh, experiences with contracts and things like that. Um, so just in closing, in closing, and I'm running, uh, I'm totally over time here. Um, just I want to talk a little bit about the opportunity that you guys have right now. And the opportunity is massive, um, just huge. And I'm, I, I would be so excited if I was in your shoes because I started back in like 96, you know, creating applications, things like that. And now fast forward, now we're like, you know, in, in 2013 and the, the opportunity is just massive. 
And people look at me and go, well, yeah, there's an opportunity, but a lot of it's on iOS and Mac. Well, yeah, there's an opportunity there, sure, but I think the bigger opportunity is playing where the big fish aren't playing yet. Uh, I always tell, I talk a lot of people about business as well. Uh, you know, there's this whole red ocean, blue ocean strategy. You know, you got to try and find where there's opportunity, uh, not where the opportunity already happened. And where the opportunity hasn't happened yet is in Windows, because Windows 8 just came out. The Slate with, you know, the Windows 8 uh, Slate Pro device that allows you to run desktop applications as well as the, the, the modern UI applications just came out like weeks ago. And the new Xbox is just around the corner. I mean, the opportunity that you guys have right now even just if you look at Windows 8 and all the people upgrading to Windows, or sorry, Windows 7 and everyone upgrading to Windows 8 is absolutely massive. The other huge advantage you have is that there's so many developers, people like yourself that have already been writing applications for Windows 7 that already know how to write applications for modern UI. All you need to know is, you know, learn about the grid, learn about typography, and you already know Visual Studio, so kind of to jump in there and build applications is a no-brainer. I hadn't built any applications last year. This year, I've already uh, developed almost 53 applications for the store. Why? Because I know there's a huge opportunity out there. So yeah, I'm building animal sounds. Yeah, I'm building transit applications. More so so that I'm teaching myself how to build applications. And I present a lot, and I do a lot of you know different things now, marketing and whatnot. But I still want to know my technology. You know, I, I, deep down inside, I, I always wear the geek jacket because I'm a proud geek, and I call myself a geek because I love programming. I love creating. I love the, the ability to create something, to see people download something, and that's where the opportunity is so massive right now, I can't even explain it to you, uh, to develop applications for Windows 8. The fact that you're on this call, the fact that there aren't thousands of people on this call yet is mind-boggling to me, but it's your advantage. It's your opportunity. You can differentiate yourself. Like I said, I, I put out an app a couple of weeks ago. It has thousands of downloads already. I don't even know how many it has now. Look up Animal Sounds. You'll find it. It's my app. And uh, yeah, it's just amazing how many the opportunity you have right now. And the one thing I will say before I before I recap, and maybe I'll load up the recap screen here, is a lot of people come up to me and they'll tell me they'll be like, you know, I don't really have time, right? I already do my day to day job. I kind of do, you know, I'm, I'm taking this course right now just because you know I want to kind of learn, you know, how to develop future apps, but I probably don't have the time. People always have time. And when I'm in a live audience, I always tell people right now. I tell them, and you can do this at home, and you don't, you're not gonna look silly because no one's watching you. So raise your hand, right? Right now, drop whatever you're doing, drop your pen, paper, whatever it is, raise your hand. Raise it as high as you possibly can. Okay? Now everybody's got their hands in the air. Now just raise your hand just a little bit higher. Just a little bit higher. So now everybody should be smirking if you did it. And if you didn't do it, you're smirking at me saying I didn't do it. Uh, but if you did do it, you should have raised it a little bit higher. And I think we can all do a little bit more. And by you, you know, sitting here for a few hours, learning the, the importance of design, and now learning the importance of, you know, blend and using the tooling in the future, you know, kind of uh, things you're going to listen to today, super important. You can do it. You can learn. You can take advantage uh, of Windows 8 release, and you can really kind of take things uh, to the next level. So just, you know, real quick recap, you know, try and do more with less. You know, really focus on what you're great at. What is your app going to be great that you're going to build today? Remember, content before Chrome, super important. Pride in craftsmanship. You know, don't forget about the typography. Don't forget about uh, the grid layout. Don't try and override them. Um, make your applications fast and fluid. Make sure they flow and continually flow through all those different motion elements. Um, don't forget about the ergonomics. What? How are people going to use your application? They're going to hold it in their hand. Is it a book reader? Where should you place things? You know, should you place them where they're not going to touch them all the time? Is it a game? Where is it easiest for them to have the controls for the game? Um, try and keep it a really simplified flow um, and make it authentic, authentically digital. Right? If you're building an application that categorizes elements, don't just make them grid. You know, maybe allow people to sort them and look at things through different perspectives. Um, maybe you know, use Sea Dragon technologies and different things like that to try and make immersive 3D experiences, whatever it is. There's so many, so many different technologies you could use. Azure, whatever it is, you can use so many different things uh, within it. Um, you know, maybe it's an infographic. Maybe it's uh, you know, using um, 
the different uh, links and things like that. Uh, and ensuring you win is one. Make sure you use those contracts that are available to you. Try and keep a consistent uh, UI model as you build it. And try and remember that one plus one does equal three, and there is a huge opportunity for you out there. Windows is the largest platform worldwide, and it will continue to be for years and years to come. Um, you have an incredible opportunity as .NET developers to take your skills to the next level uh, to really kind of take advantage uh, of what you have available to you. You know, just to end off with some of the resources, and I'll hand it back to Jonathan here. Um, you know, Windows 8, you know, getting started, tons of stuff there. You know, there's a free Windows 8 90-day evaluation there that you can go ahead and, and take a look at. Uh, there's a design center with the Windows uh, Store apps, and then there's also a dev center as well uh, with Windows Store apps available to you as well. You can find all these things online. They're super simple. If, uh, if we have time, I don't think we will for Q&A. Um, I'd love to take your questions. If you want to ask me on Facebook as well, I'm on Facebook. I'm very easy to reach. I'd love to hear from you. I hope this session was valuable to you. I tried to cram in it as quickly as possible, but it is usually a really long session. I hope it was valuable to you. I uh, hope you guys uh, keep dreaming the extreme, live with passion, and I'll hand it back to uh, Jonathan.